Christian Pulisic's move here is a pretty good summary of the U.S. men's performance in World Cups. The United States is a country traditionally known for basketball, baseball, and that other sport they somehow call football. Shouldn't it be hand egg? But somehow, the United States has discovered a sudden surge in talent. And now, with their best players taking important roles next to stars like Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Erling Haaland, it has us asking the question, will the United States actually win a World Cup one day? It's dangerous to talk like that. We've been talking like that too much for too long. And I still think we're a ways off before we should start talking about what it's going to take to win the World Cup. But. We're becoming a bigger part of the conversation. This week, Oh My Goal investigates what's been happening with men's football in the US and what does the future hold for them? Before we begin, I wanna give a shout out to all the beautiful comments about my hair on the last video. And a special shout out to Wyatt. The United States has been consistently qualifying for World Cups for the last 30 years. What about 2018, you ask? Shh. We don't talk about that here. The US was normally present in early World Cups, but from 1954 to 1986, they failed to qualify every single time. While the world got to see talents like Pele and Maradona, the US became known for their affinity for baseball, a sport so boring that pajamas are worn as a uniform because even the players are falling asleep. US soccer was always seen as kind of an immigrant sport, right? It was always seen as like a foreign sport. But there's actually a lot of US citizens who are very passionate and knowledgeable when it comes to football. Sometimes the response I get, whether it's from the UK or Mexico is, oh, this is the gringo who actually knows. A gringo que sabe. They know the game and love the culture, even the kids. The Heart of Oaks, Ghana. The US hosted a tournament in 1994 and even made the second round where they lost to eventual champions, Brazil. And ever since then, the sport has only grown and grown in the US. And then, like seemingly overnight, a whole squad of young stars in their late teens and early 20s started bursting onto the scene and actually getting signed by pretty big clubs. Now they're celebrating goals with Messi and Ronaldo. Some of the questions I've gotten, especially in the last few months, are how did this happen overnight? Around a decade ago, there was a light sprinkling of Americans spread out across Europe. Clint Dempsey, Brian McBride, and Carlos Bocanegra were at Fulham. Tim Howard was at Everton, and Jeff Cameron was debating animals at the Tiger King Zoo? Wait, that can't be right. And no, I am not the Tiger King, or Bruno Fernandez, and I'm definitely not Mr. Beast in disguise. Christian Pulisic was the first attacking American talent to attract the world's attention when he burst onto the scene at Borussia Dortmund. Now, he's Chelsea's number 10, and speaking as an American, to see a player at a top European club wearing the number 10 jersey, it's just incredible. And he's not the only one. Gio Reyna is following in his footsteps at Dortmund, Tim Weah is at Lille, Weston McKinney's become a key player in Juventus' midfield, and Serginho Dest and Conrad are rubbing shoulders with Messi at Barcelona. So how did all these American stars go from places like Craven Cottage to the Camp Nou? It really wasn't overnight. I understand why it looks that way because so many of these moves happened in the last few months. But I remember going to Germany in early 2019 and traveling around the country and interviewing Christian Pulisic and Tyler Adams and Weston McKenney and Chris Richards. So this was happening maybe at a lower, slightly lower level, though not that much lower. A lot of them gave credit to Christian Pulisic for sort of showing them the way, as they put it. These players didn't just come out of nowhere. The football culture in the US has been steadily changing in recent years. 20 years ago, US soccer did a lot to rearrange the academy system and the youth football system in the US. And that was a monumental moment. What you're seeing now is, is young American players coming here that grew up in more established environments. And with that, You've seen more European clubs then start to realize that there is more refined football talent in our country at younger ages. Those two things together has led to more of these young players being able to show how good they are. It's incredible to see how much talent is emerging from the United States, but the national team could still get even better. And for them to do that, they'll have to overcome a few obstacles. Although they play for and represent the US, not all of them came through. American systems, right? I think we're seeing more diversity at the top level 
but then when you filter that down to clubs, you know, it's not as diverse as we need it to be at that level. Each star at the moment seems to have taken a slightly different path. Many are trying to get over to Europe quite young, which is probably a great strategy for those players who can afford it or the ones that are granted the opportunity. But back in the US, it can be hard for all young players to even get a fair shot at a good footballing environment. It's kind of the wild, wild west. And for that, we have to look at one of the US's biggest obstacles. The pay to play structure. What is pay to play? <laughs> So in Europe, access to competitive football is based on your talent level. Basically, if you're good, you can find a competitive club. But in the US, if you want to play at a higher level of competition, you gotta pay. A lot of the best clubs are often the most expensive clubs too. And if you don't have the dough, you might want to invest in some pajamas and try baseball. The US is a pay to play system. The better you are, the more expensive it is. So if your kid is really good when he's 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, now you gotta put in travel teams. And most of these teams, now you're spending five to $8,000 a year. The communities most impacted by this tend to be minority groups. US soccer has historically been a sport for white, middle-class, upper-class families and players. So soccer becomes uh, marketed as a safe sport, right? It becomes marketed as a family sport. <laughs> and, you know, kind of in racially coded terms, it becomes marketed as a white sport. Families cannot afford that, especially in the Latino market. When you look at those top teams, they're made up of a lot of white kids, not a lot of Latino kids or black kids. While access is a problem across the board, there were also specific issues that impacted the Latin American community in the US, and more specifically, Mexican American dual citizens. This demographic has been massively underrepresented at the national team level. Most people agree that until the US can sort out these issues, they won't be fulfilling their potential as a footballing nation. We still have to focus inwardly on our development and on our systems and on producing that next you know, crop of talent. Still, there are some positive developments. Escoto said that the US has gotten better at recruiting Mexican Americans in particular, and there are other things to be excited about too. We're starting to see particularly more black players, right? I'm thinking about uh, the game against Panama last November. I mean, it was like seven or eight players of African descent. Once we start to see kind of a reflection, right, of the U.S. makeup, right, <laughs> that U.S. is not this monolithic white, you know, group, then we'll start to see better results, right, on the national level. Dr. Scott pointed out places like Harlem, Ann Arbor, and Detroit, because these places are building football community projects that can help reshape the future of football in the US, which makes us hopeful for United States football and the future of the program. But will that translate into success at the international level? That's the big question. So here it is. Will the US ever win a World Cup? It's realistic to think that US team in 26 could go deep. I almost wonder if they might just have that sort of attitude in Qatar of, like, let's go for it. Let's not even worry about what the stakes are and see how far we can take this. For the next, you know, 15, 20 years, we could see the U.S. making some serious, you know, stride. I think we can have success in the next World Cups over the next four, eight, 12 years. But at the same time, we know how many players, you know, it takes to have depth in a squad. I think they are hard. But, I mean, it'll be interesting, 26 at home, with those players being 27, 28, I mean, it, it's gonna be amazing to watch them grow and, and, and as the new ones come out too. So that funnel is growing with really good players. We've gone through a lot in that investigation. In short, the United States has made some major changes to their recruitment and development programs, but they've still got a long way to go. Even with some great new talents and more on the way, the US is still some way off the level of countries like France or Germany. But nearly everyone agrees that they'll get there someday, and maybe sooner than we think.